And so my friends, would you please bow your heads with me as we talk to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, dear God, for this amazing opportunity we have to connect on social media. Oh, Heavenly Father, the enemy tried to shut down the church, but you just opened churches in every single home. And so, Father, we bless you and we magnify you, we glorify you, dear God, for no weapon that is formed against us will prosper. And every tongue that rises up against us in judgment shall be condemned. And so, mighty Father, we, we just welcome your presence, dear Father. We recognize your presence. And we ask, dear Father, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit may be with us as we reflect upon your word. We ask, dear Father, that the anointing of the Holy Spirit may speak to us, mighty God, as we open up your word. And so, Spirit of the living God, may you fall afresh on us, break us, melt us, mold us, fill us with your supernatural power. And may you do what you do best. May you work revival. May you work renewal. And may you do your thing with us, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. Acts chapter 5. Welcome, Mishi. Acts chapter 5. And we are in verses 12 and 13. Acts chapter 5. And when you have it, turn to verse, verse 12. Acts 5. And I'm reading from verse 12 to verse 13. Here's what the Bible says. And through the hands of the apostles... Many signs and wonders were done among the people. We, we, we left off last, last Sabbath with the subject, uh, the, the plight or the curse of carnal worship. And we just saw as Ananias and Sapphira came into the presence of God before the apostles and they lied. And we, and we learned as the Holy Spirit revealed the deception to Peter and they dropped down dead. My friends, you would imagine that the entire church was in an uproar. Individuals had a renewed sense of awe for the majesty of God. And so we pick up in Acts chapter 5, verse 12, where it says, And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Acts 5, verses 12 and 13. Verse 13 says, Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people seemed, but the people esteemed them highly. I want to read verse 13 again. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. My friends, for those of you who are just joining, we are in Acts 5. And our scriptural meditation for today is verses 12 and 13. And I will read it again. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people, and they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. I want to speak for the next few moments on the subject, impressed, but not committed. Impressed, but not committed. Heavenly Father, may you exalt the proclamation of the everlasting gospel today far above all principalities and powers may jesus christ be uplifted exclusively and eternally and may each of us be drawn into a deeper love connection with him we pray in jesus's name amen impressed but not committed as a as a little boy i was always deeply impressed by my grandfather's life story. He was the oldest of four children and at the tender age of 10, he, he lost his dad. And his father was the, the, the financial safeguard of the family. So my grandfather at the age of 10, he had to drop out of school to work to support his, his family, his, his mother and his siblings. He worked various odd jobs. He, he, he took care of his family from the young age of 10. He, he relentlessly pursued sound mentorship. He read books to educate himself and eventually he, he actually became quite wealthy. By the time I was born in the late 70s, my grandfather was 55 years old. And all I saw in his life was 
success and power. And I must admit, my friends, that I was impressed with my grandfather. Government leaders would pay social visits to our home. Notice I said our home because I went to the island of St. Lucia at the tender age of two from Canada with my mother. And um, obviously I went to my grandfather's home who was well established, who was quite successful. And immediately I claimed his home as my home. So his home became our, our home. And so the fact that I would see government leaders coming in and out of the house to pay my grandfather social visits, it, it, it proved to me that he must have been a big deal in the country. To say that I was impressed actually would, would, would be an understatement. I, I adored my grandfather. I, I imitated him. I would wait till my grandfather left to go to work every morning and I would go into his bedroom and try on his clothes. I would wear all his suits and I will put his ties around my neck. I would put my shoes into his feet and even though they would drown my feet, I felt powerful. I felt influential for I was wearing my grandfather's clothes. I didn't just settle down for messing around with his clothes, but I would also go to find where he had his various guns hidden. My grandfather had many guns. He had a double barrel gun, he had a shotgun, he had a, he had a pistol, he had many guns, my friends. I don't think my grandfather realized how intuitive I was as a young child. And so no matter where he hid his guns, I always found them and I would play with them, my friends. You know, it's a miracle I'm alive because every single one of those guns I found and I played with that belonged to my grandfather, believe it or not, my friends, they were all loaded. I always wondered why the, why the helpers in the house would become so panicky Whenever, as a little boy, I would run out into the living room waving my grandfather's guns. They would run for cover, my friends. They would run for cover. And I never quite understood. I'm just playing. You see, what they knew and what I didn't know is that those guns were loaded. Those guns were lethal weapons. My friends, not only did I play with my grandfather's guns, as a little boy, I would take pleasure in putting his tobacco pipes into to my lips and I would pretend to be smoking it like a big shot. I would sit in his office with my legs up on his table when he was not around and I would act like him. I would make fake calls to the prime minister and to the various ministers of government in St. Lucia and I would talk to them and tell them what is what. I would, I would act like my grandfather, my friends. I would I would get into his Mercedes Benz as a young child and I would pretend to drive his Mercedes Benz even before I understood what driving was. Then one very fateful day, my friends, I decided that sitting in my grandfather's brand new vehicle was not enough. In spite of the fact that I didn't know what driving was, I decided to put the vehicle to, to, to swing the key, to put down the handbrakes, and I just press on the gas. <laughs> well, my friends, I didn't realize that before you press on the gas, you need to ascertain what gear the vehicle with is in. And the vehicle just shot out of the driveway. And Lord have mercy. Would you believe it, my friends? It ran into a tree. Now, I had a problem. Because before my grandfather left the house, he left his prized vehicle in the garage in mint condition, I had a problem. Now, not only was his vehicle no longer in the garage, it was no longer in mint condition. But my friends, I was always very creative as a little child. So I decided to fix his vehicle. I was only about 13 years old. And so I, I pushed the vehicle back into the garage and I tried to push it right into the exact location that it was. And I pulled up the handbrakes and as I left, I saw that there was a gaping hole, a gaping hole in my grandfather's brand new vehicle. So because I was so creative, I went into the workshop and I took some paint. Now, you know, my friends, any of you who knows about paint and you know that paint 
has a way of congealing. I'm going to use that word again. Paint has a way of congealing. And so there were, there were parts of the paint that became rubber. So I pulled off the paint and I stuck the rubbery paint into the hole and I pressed it down like a master, like, like a master body man. And I passed some paint over it. By that time, my friends, it was becoming evening and my grandfather hadn't arrived home as yet. So I didn't realize that, that the color of the paint that I used didn't quite match the vehicle. Well, my friends, the following morning, the following morning, after my grandfather had breakfast and he went into the garage to look at his prized vehicle, I heard words that I have never heard before in my entire life coming from my grandfather's mouth. And because it's the Sabbath, my friends, I will just leave the story there, but it, it wasn't very nice. It wasn't very nice. You know, my friends, I truly, I truly admired my grandfather. I looked up to my grandfather. But if I'm truly honest with you this morning, I must admit that I really only imitated the externals of his lifestyle. For the internal disciplines that led him to where he was, the, the, the internal commitment that led him to where he was, my friends, which drove him daily to do certain things, which drove him daily to make certain decisions, which drove him daily to live his life in a particular way. As a matter of fact, they stressed me out. He would always wake up early, my friends, when everybody else is sleeping. And he would have the audacity to go into the bathroom and begin to brush his teeth and shower and shave and hum and sing songs, my friends. It's early in the morning. The discipline. He had breakfast every single, at the same time every single day at 7.30 a.m. He would go to his office every single day at 25 minutes past 8. He would have lunch every single day at 12.30 and tea every single day at 3.30. And he would have dinner every single evening my friends at 5 30 he would watch the evening news on hts and bbs the local television stations in st lucia at that time he would watch the evening news every single day at 7 p.m my friends and he would get ready for his evening routine he would go into his office before he went to bed and he would reminisce on his day he would take stock of his day and he would take notes as to how he would make his tomorrow better than his today. And all these specific peculiarities of my grandfather's life actually stressed me out because they were too much. My friends, I was impressed, but I was not committed to following through. I wanted the privileges of being successful, but I didn't want the responsibilities of being successful. Would you know, my friends, it took a crisis to turn things around in my life. And it was the great crisis of 1996. For those of you who follow the news closely, you may, have learned, you may have heard about the great crisis of 1996. When I had left Canada from my first year in university to go down to St. Lucia as a young university student, and um, my life was set. Long before I was born, my grandfather had money put aside for me to take care of my university education. My life was set, but I left Canada to go down to St. Lucia on holidays in the summer of 1996. My friends, it was a great crisis. And I was home one summer afternoon all by myself. My grandfather had just bought another brand new vehicle. I don't know, my friends, there's something with me and brand new vehicles. He had just bought another brand new vehicle. This time, my friends, it was a fully loaded truck. Brand new. As a matter of fact, some of the plastic was still on the seat. And then I was bored at home, so I decided to take the vehicle for a spin. It was a rainy day. I got into the vehicle and I began to speed down the highway. I must admit that this was about... Four years later, after my previous encounter with his Mercedes-Benz, so I had a little more experience. I think I knew what I was doing. It was raining and I 
began to speed down the road, those winding, meandering roads on the small island of St. Lucia. And as I sped down the road, my friends, because I'm not a prophet, because I'm not a psychic, I had no way of knowing that there was a truck stalled, parked around the corner. And as I came speeding around the corner, I collided with that parked lorry, that parked truck. My friends, all I remember was hearing an explosion. The front of the vehicle almost came into the vehicle and water and smoke began to gush out everywhere. Now, my friends, I had a problem. How do I get out of this sticky situation? My grandfather had left his brand new vehicle in the garage. He had gone to work with his other vehicle. Now, not only was the vehicle no longer in the garage in mint's brand new condition, but the vehicle was about uh, seven miles away from the house in a totally written off condition. I had a problem. I realized, my friends, that there was no way to get the vehicle back to the garage and make it look exactly how I found it. So I decided, my friends, you know, forget it. I'm just going to call my grandfather and say, Grandfather, we have a problem. We have a problem. It's a, it's a big problem, Grandfather. Are you, are, you, are you seated right now? You need to sit for this one, Granddaddy. Sit for this one. I, um, before I could begin to explain my story, my grandfather said to me, Toya, tell me where the blank, 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 my blank, blank, blank vehicle is. I said, Daddy, please calm down. You know, there's no, no need, you know, to, to get upset. You know, we have a little problem. He said, no, we don't have a problem. You have a problem. Tell me where my blank, blank vehicle is. My friends, I had to confess my sins. And once again, I heard words from my grandfather that I've never heard before and which I've never heard since. Well, my friends, I mentioned to you that it was a great crisis of 1996. Before I was born, my grandfather had my entire future set up for me to pay for my university degree. The damages to the vehicle came up to $55,000. So guess what he did, my friends? My grandfather, rest his soul, my loving grandfather made an executive decision. He didn't even discuss it with me. He made an executive decision to go into the bank account that he had for me and to withdraw all of the money for my education, my education. He withdrew all of the money for my education, my friends, to pay for his vehicle. An executive decision. My grandfather taught me a valuable lesson that day. That it's not enough to be impressed with the success of others. It's not enough to be impressed with the wealth of others. It's not enough to be impressed with the accomplishments of others. Son, listen to me and listen to me well. You need to move from being impressed to being committed. You see, my friends, impression is admiration, but commitment is dedication. Impression is about observation, but, but commitment is about implementation. Impression is a distant phenomenon, but commitment is an up-close and personal reality. In case you were thinking, my friends, that this is just a personal story, a personal challenge that I struggle with, I have news for you. And it is that my problem is a universal problem. My question is, my friends, and my concern is this. There are many individuals who live their lives settling for just being impressed. My question is today, what are you recognized for? What contribution are you making to the world and to the cause of Christ? Understand, my friends, that the purpose of the gospel is not to impress you. 
God didn't give us the gospel to impress us. The purpose of the gospel is to transform us into a life of commitment. After working with churches for about 20 years now in various countries, I have come to realize as a minister, I have come to one conclusion, that one of the main problems that hinders us from fulfilling our mission is that we have too many members who come to church to just be impressed. Do you know, my friends, that there are actually some people who choose what church they are going to go to based on how impressive the service is? Do you know that? I know, my friends, because I was one of them. There are individuals who choose what church they are going to go to based on who is preaching, based on what praise team is on, based on how entertaining the service is, based on how the service makes them feel. There are some individuals, my friends, who choose what church to go to based on how the service impresses them. My friends, I was a new student in university. I will not mention what university because I went to university both in Canada and in Trinidad. But I was a student in university during my undergrad and I would go to the university church. And my friends, believe it or not, I would go there every single weekend. I would go empty and I would leave empty. For some reason, my friends, the pastor of the church, he, he wasn't very lively. He was very monotone. He would stand up and just read the sermon. And I would leave church every single weekend frustrated and empty and unfulfilled and unimpressed. And so I decided to talk to the Holy Spirit about the pastor. I said, Holy Spirit, this man is the pastor of the church. And every time I go to church, this man is just speaking in a monotone fashion, Holy Spirit. He seems to have no passion. He seems to have no excitement for the gospel. He seems as if somebody is forcing him to preach. Holy Spirit, can you please change this pastor and give this pastor some life. My friends, do you know? <laughs> do you know what the Holy Spirit said to me? The Holy Spirit said to me, you are getting nothing when you go to church because you are bringing nothing. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. The Holy Spirit said to me, you are getting nothing when you go to church because you are bringing nothing when you go to church, my friends. The truth of the matter is that if you go to church and throughout the entire service, you can't get a blessing, you can't get a word from the Lord, you can't get a breakthrough, you can't get a, an inspiration and a revelation, my friends. The truth of the matter is that the problem is most likely not with the praise team. The problem is not with the preacher. The problem is not with the church leaders. The problem is with you. Listen to what David says in Psalm 100 verse 4. In Psalm 100 verse 4, David says, Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. David says, my friends, when we go to church, we need to go to church with a blessing. When we go to church, we need to go to church with a praise report on our lips. When we go to church, we need to go to church with a pep in our steps, with a spring in our wings, with a zeal in our heels, with a song on our tongues, with a gospel chart on our hearts to direct us in the purpose and the anointing of God. When we go to church, my friends, we should not go to church looking for a blessing. We should go to church to bring a blessing. Sing. The Holy Spirit wasn't done with me yet. The Holy Spirit said to me, furthermore, the reason why you don't get anything when you go to church on a weekend is because you only go to church on a weekend. Lord have mercy. Lord have mercy. <laughs> Brother Clyde, the Holy Ghost said, the reason why you don't get anything, Dr. Collins, when you go to church on a weekend is because you only go to church on a weekend. But if you practice, Lord have mercy, going to church on Sunday, 
in personal devotions and going to church on Monday and going to church on Tuesday and going to church on Wednesday as you wake up in the morning and you kneel down beside your bed and you open up the Bible and you sing songs of praise to God's name, my friends. It doesn't matter if you can't hold a note to save your life. You just use the voice that you have for the psalmist says, let everything that have breath Praise the Lord, my friends. If you practice going to church on a Thursday and going to church in the presence of God in worship on a Friday, my friends, by the time Sabbath comes, my friends, you are going to step into the church grounds. You are going to step into the church building pregnant with inspiration, pregnant with hope, my friends filled with revival, anointed with the word from God, you are going to enter into his court with thanksgiving, into his presence with praise. My friends, that's a sad reality. The sad reality of the individuals in our opening text in Acts chapter 5, verse 12 and 13 is that they were impressed, but they were not committed. That's a sad reality. I want to read it again, my friends, in case you missed it. Acts chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. A revival is being experienced in the early apostolic church. A reformation is being experienced in the early apostolic church. Miracles are taking place in the early apostolic church. And this is what the Bible says. Acts chapter 5, verse 12 and 13. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. Yet none of the rest dared join them. But the people esteemed them highly. My friends, that's it. They were impressed with the reality of the apostles' anointing. But they were not committed to the process of the apostles' anointing. Now, my friends, understand this. Let me hasten to add this, Brother George. Let me hasten to add this. That the apostles' anointing is actually the anointing that God wants and has for every single Christian, Brother Merrill. I said the apostle's anointing, Brother Merrill, the apostle's anointing is actually the anointing that God wants and has for every single Christian. As you read the book of Acts, what you see Peter doing, what you see Paul doing, what you see Silas doing, what you see the apostles doing, that's what God has for you to do. And the anointing you see manifested in their lives, Dr. Collins, that's the anointing that God wants to be manifested in your life. How do I know that? Let's turn to Mark, Mark chapter 16. It's funny how, many, how, how when many individuals read the Great Gospel Commission, they only read the version in Matthew chapter 28. Because, my friends, that's actually the safe version of the Gospel Commission. The rendition given in Matthew chapter 28 is the safe version of the Gospel Commission. But there is another version of the Gospel Commission that Christ gives in Mark chapter 16, verses 14 to 16, my friends, which is the version that troubles many Christians. And so let's read it. Come with me, come and go with me to the book of Mark. My Lord, I'm beginning to perspire here. I think I need to remove my jacket. Lord have mercy. It's getting hot in here today. Come with me, my friends. Come and go with me. Come and go with me. Come and go with me. Check this out, my friends. Come and go with me. To the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 16. And I want you to read uh, from verse 14 to verse 16. I said, my friends, I said that, that the apostles' anointing that we see in the book of Acts is actually the anointing, the same anointing that God wants and God has for all of his Christians, for all Christians. Mark chapter 16, listen to what Christ says. Mark 16 from verse 14 to verse 16. Or rather, let's take from verse 14 to verse 18. Mark 16, 14 to 18. Later, the Bible says, Jesus appeared to the eleven as they sat at the table. 
and he rebuked their unbelief and hardness of heart because they did not believe those who had seen him after he had risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Now listen to what's going to happen to those who believe and are baptized. It says, they will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. It says in verse 7, listen to what's going to happen to those who believe and are baptized. Verse 17 of Mark chapter 16. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. In my name, they will speak with new tongues. In my name, they will take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly poison, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Here it is, my friends. The same anointing that we see manifested in the experience of the apostles in the book of Acts is the same anointing that the Holy Spirit longs, longs, my friends, to pour upon you and to fill your life with. May I remind you? May I remind you, my friends? Do I have your permission to remind you of what Ephesians chapter 3 verse 19 says? That God wants to fill you with all of his fullness, with all of his power, with all of his glory, with all of his anointing, my friends. And so the book of Acts reveals to us the process. The book of Acts reveals to us the process of this anointing. And we realize, my friends, that it begins with praying. What does it begin with? It begins with praying. For in the book of Acts, chapter 1, Jesus Christ said to the disciples, do not leave Jerusalem. In other words, you are under quarantine in Jerusalem. And you need to be under quarantine in Jerusalem until you receive, hallelujah, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. So would you know, my friends, the disciples, would you know, my friends, the disciples didn't complain that they were under quarantine. The disciples didn't say, oh, look at me, poor me. I'm at home. Poor me, I can't leave home. Poor me, I'm under quarantine at home, in my home, sleeping on my own bed, sitting on my own couch, eating my own food. Oh, poor me. Lord have mercy. The things we complain about. The disciples, my friends, didn't complain. They were under quarantine in Acts chapter 1. So guess what they did? They transformed their quarantine into a context for personal revival. In Acts chapter 2, they were together in one accord under quarantine and they began to pray, my friends. I want to talk for a second, Dr. Collins, about praying. Many people think that prayer is presenting God with a shopping list. God, I want. God, give me. God, do this, my friends. Prayer is not a conductor's baton to direct God. Prayer is not an instrument to manipulate the hand of God, my friends. You want to know what prayer is? Prayer at its highest level is submission to the will of God. Prayer is allowing ourselves to come to the place where we submit to the will of God. In Romans 8 verse 20, Romans 8 verse 26, it says, as a matter of fact, most of the times we don't even know what we should pray for as we ought, but the Holy Spirit presents the deep, hidden, passionate desires of our hearts to God with groanings that cannot be articulated through human language. So prayer at its highest level, my friends, is not about you speaking because your words have no power. My words have no power. Prayer at its highest level is about us submitting. I mentioned, my friends, that submission is a compound word. Sub means, which means to come under, and mission, which means the purpose. So prayer at its highest level is submission, coming under the purpose of the Holy Spirit. Prayer is not about you articulating your own purpose. It's not about me articulating my own purpose. Prayer is about coming under the submission of coming under the mission of the Holy Spirit, submitting to his purpose. And so that's what the disciples did. In Acts chapter 2, they prayed. That means they submitted to the will of God. 
Then praying in Acts chapter 2 led to anointing, which is the second stage in the process, my friends. In the process of this anointing, it began with praying and the praying led to the anointing. Now, my friends, if praying is submission to God's will, guess what anointing is? Anointing is empowerment for God's will. God will not anoint anybody if that person has not first submitted to God's will. Because the anointing is for empowerment to fulfill God's will, for God's will to be perpetuated in your life and in my life. That's what Jesus Christ prayed in Matthew chapter 6, verse 10. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven, my friends. That's the heart of the Lord's prayer. And so every time we pray, what should be at the heart of our praying? What should be at the epicenter of our praying? Should be thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Through me as it is in heaven. Then the anointing, my friends, leads to, guess what? The anointing leads to the preaching. The preaching. So if praying is submission to God's will, I'm using all the prepositions today. If praying is submission to God's will and anointing is empowerment for God's will, guess what preaching is? Preaching is proclamation of God's will to God's will for and of. I gave you three prepositions. Three prepositions. Praying, submission to God's will. Anointing, empowerment for God's will. Preaching, proclamation of God's will. Now, my friends, I'm about to come right into your living room or wherever you are. I'm about to come right into your bedroom, right into your back, wherever you are, my friends, looking at this sermon, I'm about to come right in there and get in all of your business. Understand this, my friends. Every anointed believer is a preacher. Every anointed believer is a preacher. Preaching is not a spiritual gift that God only gives to some individuals. Every anointed believer is a preacher. You know, I read a book when I was in university by Charles Bradford, who was the first president of my dear division, the North American Division of Seventh-day Adventists. Charles Bradford. And he wrote a book called Preaching to the Times. And in that book... Dr. Charles Bradford says this, preaching is simply the gospel communicated through personality. Did you get that? Preaching is the gospel communicated through personality. So I have one question for you, my friends. In fact, I have three questions for you. First question for you is this, do you have a personality? Yes or no? My answer for you is yes. My second question is, have you come into contact with the powerful transforming gospel of Christ? And my third, quest, my, my third question is, are you a preacher? My friends, preaching is the gospel communicated through personality. So as long as you have a personality, as long as you've come into contact with the transforming gospel of Christ, you are a preacher. Now, what that looks like may be a different story. You may not be able to preach the gospel like Peter preached the gospel on the day of Pentecost, my friends, but you can preach the gospel by being kind to other individuals. You can preach the gospel, my friends, when you are at work and when your colleagues are giving rude jokes and vulgar jokes. You can preach the gospel by refusing to laugh at foolishness. You can preach the gospel, my friends, when you go out for drinks with your workers on a Friday afternoon and everybody orders vodka and they get drunk and you order orange juice. Hallelujah. You can preach the gospel. Praise the Lord and shame the devil. You can preach the gospel. You know, St. Francis of Assisi, the 13th century Christian mystic, once said, preach the gospel at all times. 
and when necessary, use words. Francis of Assisi, preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Now, my friends, I hear somebody asking me in my imagination, well, pastor, I don't know. They all received the anointing in Acts chapter 2, but we only see Peter preaching in Acts 2, my friends. That is not correct. They were all preaching in Acts chapter 2. Let me prove it to you. On the day of Pentecost, there were 120 individuals preaching. How do I know that? Come and go with me to the book of Acts. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. Let's check it out now. Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and check out verse 15. Acts 1 verse 15. And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples. Altogether, the number of names was about 120. So how many individuals were in the upper room? 120. How many individuals received the anointing of the Holy Spirit? Let's read on. Jump down to Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all, the all from Acts 1, verse 15, 120. They were all with one accord in one place. They were all praying, 120 of them. How many of them received the anointing of the Holy Spirit? The Bible says in verse 2, And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. The entire place was filled. Now understand this, my friends, that the anointing does not fill inanimate objects. Because we already learned that the anointing fills people, Ephesians 3 verse 19. So when the Bible says in Acts 2 verse 2 that the anointing of the Holy Spirit filled the entire house, that means it filled every single individual. Verse 3, then there appeared to them, which them, the 120 of them, divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. That means each of them had a complete anointing. Each of them had a full anointing, my friends. Verse 4, and they were all filled. How many of them? How many of them, my friends? Tell me. Acts 2 verse 4. How many of them were filled with the anointing of the Holy Spirit? They were all filled, 120 of them, and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Understand this, my friends. On the day of Pentecost, it's not only Peter who was preaching. Every single one of them was preaching. Let me read on. Acts 2 verse 5. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound, sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because everyone heard them speak. Do you see it? Everyone heard them speak. Acts 2 verse 6 in his own language, my friends. On the day of Pentecost, it wasn't only Peter who was preaching, my friends. Every single one of them were preaching. Does that mean that they all had a different thing to say, my friends? Whereas Peter was the one who had the metaphorical microphone, every single one of them was preaching in their own way. People were preaching by being nice to those of who, who were around them. People were preaching by embracing those around them. People were preaching by helping those around them. People were preaching, my friends, by allowing individuals ahead of them to go, by allowing people behind them to go ahead of them in the line. You know, my friends, when you go to, here's a, here is a way to preach the gospel in the supermarket. When you go to the grocery store, my friends, and you buy all your groceries, and your shopping cart is filled to the brim, you have 1,235 items in your shopping cart. And you are at the front of the line, my friends. And somebody comes behind you with just one packet of Skittles. My friends, you want to know how to preach the gospel? Move out of the way and allow the person with one packet of Skittles to go ahead of you and to pay for their Skittles to go on the happy way. And you now check out your 2,135 items. 
Peter, my friends, wasn't the only preacher on the day of Pentecost. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. And they all began to preach the word. And so the book of Acts, here it is, here it is, my friends. The book of Acts reveals to us the process of the anointing. There is praying, which is submission to God's will. There is the anointing, which is empowerment for God's will. There is preaching, which is proclamation for God's will. And the final one I want to share with you, my friends. The purpose, the ultimate purpose of the anointing is to lead us to a place of healing. A place of what? Healing. So preaching leads to the anointing. No, rather, praying leads to the anointing. The anointing leads to preaching, and preaching leads to healing. So if preaching is submission to God's, no, rather, if praying, if praying is submission to God's will, and anointing is empowerment for God's will, and preaching is proclamation of God's will, what is healing? What is the purpose of healing? Because we just read in Mark, Mark chapter 16 that every believer who comes under the anointing of the Holy Spirit will be empowered to engage in the ministry of healing. So what really is healing? Healing, get this, is transformation for God's glory. The purpose of healing is to lead us into the glory of God. The purpose for healing is to cause us to magnify the glory of God. The purpose of healing is to realign us to the original purpose of God. And the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 43 verse 7 that God created us for his glory. Now understand my friends that healing comes in various forms. Healing comes, healing can be emotional Healing can be spiritual, healing can be physical, and healing can be social. Healing comes in various forms, emotional, spiritual, physical, and social. Now, you do not need to experience every aspect of these levels of healing. But there is one aspect, my friends, which you need to experience, and that is spiritual healing. Being transformed from carnal to spiritual. And spiritual healing leads to emotional healing. In Isaiah 26 verse 3. Isaiah 26 verse 3. The Bible says, God will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on him because he trusts in him. That's emotional healing. Psalm 119 verse 165, great peace have they that love God's word and nothing shall offend them. That's emotional healing, my friends. And so it's, an, it's possible to have physical, he, spiritual healing and emotional healing, but yet not have physical healing, my friends. That doesn't mean that you aren't fulfilling the will and the glory of God. Let me, let me break it down. Understand this. That the nature of your healing will determine the nature of God's will and purpose for your life. Let me, rather, let me flip that. Let me flip that rather. The nature of God's will and purpose for your life determines the nature of your healing. That's the right way to say it. The nature of God's will and purpose for your life determines the nature of your healing. So how you are healed is based upon what God's purpose for you is. My friends, do you get that? Do you get that? How you are healed is determined by what God's will and purpose for your life is. If you don't believe me, my friends, I want you to ask Paul. You know, that's why, that's why, you know, uh, whenever people ask me to pray for them now, whenever somebody calls me and says, Pastor, pray for me now for any particular reason, I ask them why. So they say, well, you know, Pastor, um, my mother is in the hospital and um, she has cancer. Now, now, my friends, I want you to know I am being very sensitive with what I'm saying here right now. But listen to the message behind what I'm saying. So they say, Pastor, my mother is in the hospital and she has cancer. And I want you to pray for her that she's delivered. 
I ask the question, why? Why? Why do you want your mother to be delivered? Do you want your mother to be delivered so she can continue doing what she used to be doing? Why do you want your mother to be delivered? Well, Pastor, pray, pray that, you know, the coronavirus, you know, stops all around the world. Why? Why do you want Corona to go back to where it came from? Why, my friends? I ask why because I want to know what the purpose is. Because of the fact that the nature of God's will and purpose will determine the nature of our healing. This, my friend, is biblical. As Christians, we shouldn't just pray for people because people ask us to pray for them. We should pray for individuals because we are led to pray for them in the context of God's will. Because do you know, my friends, for some people, it is God's purpose for them to be sick. It is part of God's purpose for them to be sick. For some individuals, it is part of God's purpose for them to experience tribulations and suffering. Because I said, my friends, weeks ago when we first started this online journey, that God is not so in interested in your comfort as he is interested in your conversion. Why do you want me to pray for you? Because, my friends, prayer is submission to God's will. If your motive is for me to pray for you so that you can become better submitted and committed to God's will, my friends, get this. That process of submission to God's will and commitment to God's will begins with you being right where you are. Right in the situation you are, right in the circumstance you are, God is using that circumstance to bring you into submission to his will. Listen to what, listen to what James says in the book of James. James chapter, uh, chapter 4 verse 3. James chapter 4 verse 3. Listen to what it says. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. What is he saying here in James chapter 4 verse 3? The reason why you are praying and you are not receiving answers to your praying is because you are praying amiss. What does the word amiss mean, my friends? What does the word amiss mean? In this context, it means to pray outside of the context of God's will. To pray outside the context of God's will, to pray being preoccupied with your own will in order for you to perpetuate your own pleasures. James 4 verse 3, you ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your own pleasures. My friends, the nature of God's will and purpose for your life will determine the nature of your healing. If you don't believe me, if you don't believe me, my friends, just ask the Apostle Paul, who had such a powerful anointing on his life that Paul wrote more than half of the New Testament. If there ever was somebody who was anointed, it was Paul, my friends. He wrote half, more than half of the New Testament. And listen to what Paul says, our last scripture, our last scripture in 2 Corinthians. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul was suffering. Paul was sick. Paul had a struggle in his life and Paul prayed. Paul goes to God and, and Paul prays. And listen to what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 12. Turn with me there to verse 7 and 10. This is our last scripture and we're going to land this plane. Buckle your seatbelts, my friends. We are about to land. 2 Corinthians 12, 7 to 10. Paul says, And lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me. A thorn in the flesh, my friends, is a trial, a tribulation. A thorn in the flesh could be coronavirus. A thorn in the flesh was given to me. A messenger of Satan to buffet me. My friends, you know what the word buffet means? My friends, the best image I can think of is Mike Tyson. When brother Mike Tyson would get into that boxing ring, my friends, what he would do is that he would buffet his opponents. Buffet them, my friends. Punch them left, right, and center. 
By the time I and Mike were done with them, my friends, you could not recognize them. That's what Buffett means. Listen, listen to what Paul is saying. Paul is saying this, my friends. 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7. Lest I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the, revel of the revelations, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Why would God allow his children to be buffeted by coronavirus, to be buffeted by trials and tribulations, to be buffeted by, by, by problems, my friends? He says, lest I should be exalted above measure. In verse 8, he says, concerning this, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me, Lord, take it away, remove the coronavirus, remove the sickness, remove the pandemic, take it away, Lord. And listen to what God said to Paul in 2 Corinthians 12 verse 9. He said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Listen to this, my friends. Paul says, Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. My friends, this is Paul teaching us all about emotional intelligence. The ability to take your licking and still keep on kicking. The ability to take up your cross and transform it into a crown. The ability to stand upon your mess and make it into a message, my friends. That is emotional intelligence. And Paul is saying, my friends, that sometimes God in his divine purpose and divine will will choose not to deliver you the way you want God to deliver you because God's purpose for you, God's destiny for you, God's blessing for you, God's will for you is greater and more powerful than your greatest imaginations. And so Paul says, therefore, I would most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. For when I am weak, then he is strong. My friend, get this. This season that the world is going through, my friends, we are going through this season in order for us to become weak in our own strength and submit to the sovereign power of God so that God can become powerful through us. My friends, I want to let you know we are coming out of this. And we are coming out of this better than how we went into it. We are coming out of this greater than how we went into it, my friends. For in the context of this quarantine, God is molding character. In the context of this quarantine, God is bringing about spiritual breakthrough. In the context of this quarantine, God is bringing about spiritual revival and reformation. In the context of this quarantine, God is bringing about emotional deliverance and spiritual deliverance and spiritual de and, and physical deliverance and social deliverance. In the context of this quarantine, my friends, God is bringing us to the place where as a nation, as America, as Canada, as the Caribbean, as Europe, as Africa, as Asia, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord, he is God, he is King of kings and Lord of lords. He is the Lion of the tribe of Judah. He is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the first and the last. He is the beginning and the ending. He is the author and the finisher of our faith. My friends, God wants to move you today from being merely impressed to becoming committed. And my question is, will you allow him to move you today? Will you allow him to move you into your presence? Will you allow him to move you into his presence? Will you allow him to move you into his anointing? Will you allow him to move you into his power? Will you allow him to rescue you from your dysfunction? and bring you into his glorious peace and his power and his prosperity? Will you allow him, my friends, to perfect the work that he has began in you? If, my friends, this is your 
heart's desire, would you please bow your heads with me as we talk to our Heavenly Father in prayer. Almighty God, we recognize that like the believers in the book of Acts chapter 5 verses 12 and 13, many times we have settled for just being impressed. That's just being impressed by what you do, being impressed by the anointing of other individuals, being impressed by the manifestation of your glory in the lives of other individuals, dear Father. But we realize that being impressed is not enough. For nobody has ever been successful in life by merely being impressed. Nobody has ever made it to the Olympic Games by merely being impressed. Nobody has ever won a gold medal by merely being impressed. And so, dear Father, today we hear the Spirit calling us away from merely being impressed to being committed, being committed to your glory, being committed to your purpose, being committed to your will. Father, we stretch our hands to you today and we ask, Father, that you may have your will and have your way in us. And mighty God, may you be glorified through us. May you be magnified through us, dear Father. May your purposes prevail in our lives, mighty God. And may you, King of kings and Lord of lords, be glorified in our lives, dear Father. Lead us into a place of submission to your will, into a place of empowerment for your will, into a place of proclamation of your will, and into a place of transformation for your glory we pray in Christ's name. Amen and amen and amen. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. My friends, God bless you. Stay in the anointing of God, my friends, and allow God to lead you to bring you into a place of deeper commitment today. Allow God to bring you deep into his anointing and may his anointing Reign in your life. God bless you.